that, that was a great intro. I'm not going to explain what we do behind closed doors at DigitalOcean, and I'm not going to explain everything about hacking AI. I'll just give you some pointers and, and talk about some ideas. Um, how many of you have used AI? Raise your hands. Just a few, huh, interesting. How many of you have you contributed data to machine learning? Raise your hands. Not everybody, okay. Um, so I'll tell you a little, I'll, I'll go back to that, but I want to talk a little bit about how I got started. Clicker's not working. So next slide, please. <laughs> See, uh, somebody hacked my, um, <laughs> my device. Okay, so, um, you know, this was what was happening when I was a kid. It was 1978. I don't remember that specific cover. I'm not, I'm not, I'm younger than that. Um, but if we go to the next one. You know, there was a lot of buzz about computers and, and the PC and, and so on and so forth. Next, please. And I think this was 1983, which was, you know, closer to the peak of that. And so when I was growing up, this was, this was stuff that I was hearing, you know, the same way that kids now are hearing about AI and getting excited about it. So my first experience, next, um, was with this machine. So I went out and I, you know, I saved some money, I bought a Commodore 64, and you had this little tape thing where you could you know, write programs and save them on there. And at the time, you could, of course, buy programs, or you could buy magazines and type them in. Next. And you know, it was also the era of um, MTV, and you know, it was pretty, pretty interesting times. Next. But this is the way that it worked. You would go to the newsstand and you had these magazines that would tell you how to create games and type them. And you basically would have to like, sit there for hours and hours and type. So my first experience coding was next. You know, I got all excited. Um, and I went and I bought one of these magazines. And this is exactly what it looked like. You would sit there and type these numbers for hours and hours and hours. You know, and as a kid, I mean, you have nothing else to do, right? So I did that, and that was like, my first thing. But before that, um, what I did before I bought the computer, given all the hype that was going on around, I actually went to a computer store, and I knew nothing about computers. I just, you know, I had heard that they were smart, that they were intelligent, that they could do things. So I got to the store and I typed, what's my name, <laughs> on a Commodore 64. And of course it just said syntax error. And I was like, oh, I thought these things knew something. So then I typed, my name is Alex. What is my name? Again, syntax error. End of the story, you know, I bought um, the magazine, I spent hours and hours typing, and then I hit enter, and that's what I got. Syntax error again. So I didn't read the instructions. You needed to type in a, a different program first to be able to interpret all of those numbers and get, get the game. But that's, that's the way that it worked at, at the time. So that was my first experience um, coding. Um, I didn't do that badly in the end because I ended up getting a PhD in electrical engineering, doing a lot of coding and machine learning over the last 20 years. Next one, please. The timer is not working, by the way. We can fix it. So, um, the, you know, the talk is about AI, and so one of the things that's interesting if we look deeply at the concept is what is intelligence? Next. And obviously, there are many, many definitions. Um, this is one of the simplest ones, the ability to understand and learn well and to form judgments and opinions based on reason. Now, it seems pretty simple to us, but if we narrow it down and we really think about what this means, it's fairly complicated. What does understanding mean? What what is it to form judgments and opinions? Next. And if we go even deeper, right? Capacity for logic, understanding, self-awareness, learning, emotional knowledge, planning, creativity, and problem solving. That's a lot of really complicated stuff, right? Yet, we're talking about AI as if it were right there at our doorstep. And we can do all of these things now, and computers are going to replace us, and, and so on and so forth. But the reality is, um, intelligence really has so many, so many components that go way, way beyond what we can see computers doing today, right? So that's the first message that I want to convey. Next one, please. Um, so I actually wrote a blog post uh, at DigitalOcean where I talk a little bit about this. And, you know, there's a lot of, there are, a lot, there are many misconceptions about definitions, what AI is, uh, machine learning, deep learning, and, you know, it's kind of a mess, and that's okay, that usually happens with new technologies, but you know, the, the simplest definition is, you know, AI is a huge sphere that includes many, many fields. Machine learning is a much smaller subset of that. Um, and then you have deep learning, which is a, an even smaller subset, specific types of algorithms. And in general, 
when we read a lot of the articles in the media and we think of AI, I think we tend to think of human-like abilities, right? And if you think about it, that really includes cognition, language, creativity, a lot of those other things. Not just, you know, basic classification, which, which is in many ways what, exactly what machine learning and deep learning do. Next one. And, you know, in general, this is the simplest explanation that I, that I, I could um, come up with. What you do when you build a machine learning algorithm is classify data points, whatever those data points are, right? And you, so if you, if you plot them on a two-dimensional space, this is kind of what it would look like. And the machine learning algorithm, what it's actually doing is just finding that line that divides cats and dogs. So in traditional machine learning, before deep learning came about, um, humans would build the features and say, I'm going to build a cat versus dog classifier, and how do I know if it's a cat or a dog? I'm going to look at the ears, the noises that it makes, the type of hair, I don't know, whatever, right? And so if you're taking images, you would take those features, manually build them, and then you would end up with a space that's typically more than just a two-dimensional space. It could be you know, many, many dimensions. And then the machine learning algorithm, what it does is try to find that line that divides them. So pretty basic concept. And if you think of, like, what is the most basic machine learning algorithm? Anybody want to guess? What? Nobody? Sorry? Regression? Regression? No, that's a bit more complicated. <laughs> the simplest one would be a nearest neighbor, right? And you just basically say, you know, um, all the, you, you take a point and you say, whatever my nearest neighbors my nearest neighbor is, is the same thing that I am. So if, if you notice, you know, the dogs are clustered, the cats are clustered. So it's going to work in most cases, even in this example. And, you know, the variations of one, one nearest neighbors, two nearest neighbors, three, you can take any number of neighbors. And so, so as you can see in this example, it gets complicated with the edge cases. You know, the cats that kind of look like dogs and the dogs that kind of look like cats, right? Uh, so that's the most basic classif classifier. Deep learning, um, what, what it does is essentially learn those features automatically. So humans don't have to design and say, you know, I'm going to look at the ears and the mouth and the noise that it makes or how many legs it has. You just give it the images and then it automatically learns what those features are. But essentially it's doing the same thing, um, at least the classification part. It's trying to find that boundary. Next one. And I asked when we started, how many of you have used um, AI and a few people didn't raise their hands. But how many of you have phones, cell phones, or computers? I would say pretty much everybody, right? I do have friends that don't, but uh, I would say mostly everybody. So if you have a phone, you're already using AI, right? If you're searching the web, if you're getting ads, um, AI is, is, in the machine learning sense, is impacting what you see. If you're using a dating app, if you buy milk at the store, pretty much in everything. So I argue that computing is now AI, the same way that Networking is part of computing, and, and multimedia is part of computing. Next. So the question is, do we talk about hacking AI or hacking humans? And if you think about it, it's really, they're really correlated. Next. And um, the Turing test, you know, this was uh, written in 1950, uh, was basically, can machine things? That was the original question, but then he realized, well, that's, that's too hard to define. So, the next best thing is, can they imitate a human to the point where a human cannot distinguish between a human and a machine? That's the Turing test. So if you come down to that definition, then you realize that AI as a field um, can be narrowed down, and there are many, many successful stories where you can say, yeah, this is an AI, even though it's doing really simple things. Next. And so this is an example of fooling humans. Next. So this was an early system from the 1960s. Um, in the 1960s, the idea was to build these expert systems, and it was done by writing rules. So it was a large set of rules that, that basically said, if the input is this, the output is that. And so um, it was like a therapist, and you would go in and type stuff, and it would answer back to you. And it, it had very, very basic rules, but it was able to fool people. Like, people really thought they were talking to a human, right? And so the takeaway from this is that Again, 1960s, right? We can build AI systems that are super simple, that, are, that, are using, that use techniques that have existed for 40, 50, 60 years. Um, because humans are easy to trick. And so that's, that's really fascinating, right? Because to the extent that we can trick humans and, and understand um, how to do that, 
we can build better systems um, and, and, and make believe that they're real AI. Next. So now I'm going to show you some examples of cases in which some of these techniques fail. Um, um, just for the sake of thinking about the limitations. So as I said before, you know, deep learning is a set of, it's a family of techniques that basically uses layers that um, very loosely mimic the way that the brain works. Uh, so there are neurons that are connected to each other and the layers pass information up and down. That's why they're called deep, deep networks and deep learning. So you, what you can see on the top are the features that are being automatically discovered by, by that particular framework. So a lot of the work today in machine learning and in deep learning is really about um, building these architectures and saying, OK, I'm going to run it with 50 layers or 20 or 30, and then setting all of the parameters. Next. Now, what's, what's interesting is that these techniques, as I said before, take images or text or whatever input, and they produce an output. And so they internally do all this message passing back and forth, up and down. Um, so we don't really have a good understanding of exactly what they're doing, because there are thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of computations that happen at, at, um, at a very small scale, at very high resolution, where you're, you know, the, the algorithms are essentially trying to find those boundaries in different um, uh, resolutions of the image, if it's an image. And so some work has been done where they've taken They've generated images, so this is one example, and they've um, given these images to a deep network, and the deep network has made mistakes, and it's, it's, and it's like it's, it believes, you know, the one on the top right is a dial telephone, a punching bag, which humans would never make these mistakes, right? So it's, it's pretty interesting and fascinating. Next one. Here's another one where um, what the authors did was basically shift the image by a few pixels, and just that minor shift means the algorithm is, is uh, confusing a bus with an ostrich. Next. The same with this one. All the ones on the right were confused by an ostrich, and the middle one is just the difference between the two images. So very mi minor variations. Next. We can play the video, please. Um, and then there's some really exciting stuff that um, sort of includes computer graphics, machine learning. We present a novel real-time facial reenactment method that works with any commodity webcam. What, what, since our method only uses RGB data do, for both the source the and target actor, we are able what the authors to uh, do here is basically time. map this guy's facial here expressions to the video. Setup. So on you right, can take any video of somebody and make them say whatever you want, essentially. So it's, it's pretty fascinating, right? And again, I'm talking about fooling humans. A significant difference to right? previous methods okay, next is one. the re-rendering of the mouth. There's also uh, music generation. So this is a, a piece that was composed by a Oh, you can play it anywhere, please. That was composed by an algorithm after Chopin. Pretty beautiful, right? Like, you'd never guess that it was done by a computer. Next one. Similarly, there's style transfer, where you take an image and then a painting, and it'll regenerate that image using the style of that painting. So we can see the photograph on the top left and then different styles. Um, where the um, algorithm received those, those paintings that you see in the small boxes. Next. Um, there's more work now, so we're pushing the boundaries, right? Now we're getting more into creativity and doing stuff that's higher level. Um, in this particular work, the authors generate paintings without having any additional input. So the, the entire painting is generated. And so now we're creating things, not just modifying, creating. Next. In this one, um, what the authors do is take the image on the left, the 8x8 input, and then using um, deep learning, generate the images in the middle. And so you can see that it's astonishingly similar to the ground truth, to the actual images. This, has, you know, this kind of technology has a lot of interesting applications, but also many implications for obvious reasons, right? Because what the algorithm here is doing is, is it's basically guessing. It's, it's guessing that the, the woman looks like that. Um, and if this were used in law enforcement and it made a mistake, you know, the wrong person could go to jail for something they didn't do, right? Next. So along the same lines, you know, I, I think there's a lot of work in creativity. And so one of the things that, um, that I did with some of my colleagues when I was at Yahoo was try to determine whether we could build algorithms that would be able to judge creativity. So we focused on videos. Next. And the basic, you know, with a lot of these things, and that's, Part of what I wanted to convey, you have to start with the concept. 
Like, what, is, what, is, what does creativity mean? What is the creative concept? And in that case, we're talking about a creative video. How do you define a creative video in a way that you can feed that into the machine, right? So in building these algorithms, there's a very strong human component in making these definitions, making assumptions, collecting the data, training it, and so on and so forth. Next. And the same applies to video highlights, right? And so in this particular kind of work um, that, that we did while I was at Yahoo, we used a lot of crowdsourcing, basically asking people to annotate, to train the data. Next. And the same is true for aesthetics and interestingness. Next. So looking at, um, for this particular project, we were looking at automatically selecting the best portrait of celebrities to show on Yahoo Search. Next. So when you search for an actor or any celebrity, you get a little box with um, that photograph. So if you, you can imagine a lot of the challenges. Like there's, I think that's, yeah, that's Miley Cyrus. Uh, you don't want to show that photograph, right? So you need to build algorithms that automatically detect the tongue or glasses and so on and so forth. Next. So what I'm saying is we have a long way to go in terms of true AI, but we're working on more interesting and harder problems as we, as we move along. Next. And here's a list of failures. I'm not going to read them. They're quite interesting, and there's a paper that, um, that lists them. Um, but I think we'll see more and more of these. Next one. And one of the takeaways, if we look at these failures and the ones that are coming, is what I said earlier, that very often we don't consider important issues in, in the training data or in the parameters or in how things are going to be applied. Next. And so there are a lot of ethical considerations to take into account, and a lot of uh, things having to do with uh, you know, decisions that are usually made by humans. How do we translate that to algorithms? It's a really tough problem. Next. So to summar summarize, science and technology, next. Um, plus design, right? When I talk about a lot of these things like designing the, or figuring out the training data, the parameters, the architectures, and so on and so forth, the context. Next, we're talking about science, technology, and design. Is that enough for innovation? Next. I would say the answer is no. Um, and I think the shift that we need to make as a technical community is towards more human-centered methods. Next. And basically what that means is um, always take into account the user, the context, and have a cycle between the data that you're collecting, the hypotheses, the design, because everything is interrelated. Next. So to summarize and, and finish, um, the data is really critical. A lot of the failures that we've seen in the past have to do with data, like researchers or uh, you know, engineers use the wrong data, or they don't account for certain cases. So it's really important to understand data, because the quality of the data determines the quality of the algorithms. And that determines bias, ethics, culture. Taking into account different cultures is really, really critical. And it has to be an interdisciplinary process. Next. So thank you very much. And I invite you to log on to DigitalOcean and play with some of this stuff yourselves. Thanks. Damn. There it is. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, amazing talk. I really Thanks. appreciate it. There isn't any questions on slido.com, so I think we can just, uh, you might be able to safely get away. But you'll be around right. for the conference. Yeah. I'll be around. Okay. There's a question, he says. Is there oh. a question? There is a question on Slido. <laughs> Two seconds, my friends. Two seconds. I have the question. No, I don't. Yeah, go for it. You can ask the question if you'd like. Um, based on what you're saying, isn't the potential of like deep learning AI as large as the imagination of the developer's layers? That's the input for the system. That's the what? I'm sorry. The developer makes the layers for the deep learning. Yeah. Uh, so isn't the potential of that AI only limited by the imagination of the developer? Well, there are a lot of limitations, and, and I think most of them have to do with on one hand, the technical components, and on the other hand, the actual deployment, right? Like, who's going to use it, where, how? Uh, how is that interaction going to be with, with the humans? And so I think as we move forward, we should see further and further integration with human abilities and needs and, and you know, taking into account that, that cycle. So siloing it and saying, you know, it's only a technical problem is not going to do it, in my view. That, that's the main message that I wanted to get across. But thanks. Okay. 
Cool. Okay. A big round of applause for Barry. Thank you so much. Thank you.